Welcome to the podcast show by Kay Bandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Austrian Economics, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, Bitcoin. Welcome to The Total Connector Show. Uh, my name is Kevin Devani. It's all about total Bitcoin, total decentralization, and total freedom. My very special guest today is Robert Breedlove. I've been following him for, I don't know, for a long time now, and I've been reading his uh, fascinating Twitter threads, which have been reposted uh, over and over again by so many, so many people. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thanks so much for coming to my show. Um, why don't you just introduce yourself? Um, I know a lot about you. I've read about you, uh, but please go ahead. It's your floor. Thanks so much again. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Robert Breedlove. Um, I guess I've been into economics sort of most of my whole life. Um, I actually started reading The Economist pretty consistently when I was a kid, and I guess that was kind of the, the beginning of it for me. And I kind of like to I joke that I've been in digital assets since the year 2000. Um, actually, there's this massive online video game called Diablo 2, which some people may have heard of. It's similar to kind of like a World of Warcraft or something like that. And when I was a kid, you know, I think the first one came out when I was like 11. Um, there's the game itself, which are actually, um, you know, traversing these dungeons and slaying demons and this whole thing. But then in the game too, um, there were these rare items. So you could find, you know, rare bows and swords and armor and, and all that. And an interesting thing developed uh, outside of the game itself is people actually started trading these items in you know, what they called trade channels, which is sort of like, uh, you know, an exchange of sorts. And after a couple of years, you know, me and all my friends, my, my brother and stuff played this game a lot. Um, I figured out that I could actually create wealth in just the trade channels. So actually just trading the items back and forth, uh, kind of buying low and selling high, learning, learning the principles of economics sort of organically in the trenches, if you will. And long story short, this game was pretty wildly popular. I mean, I think there's millions of people that played it around the world. And eventually eBay came out, I guess maybe three or four years after this game was really popular. And these items started selling on eBay for real money. So, you know, a certain you know, unique bow, for instance, would sell for thousands of dollars online on eBay. And so all of a sudden this wealth that I had created in you know, this fictitious digital asset world, all of a sudden, um, obtained a real market value. And at the time, and I didn't know this back then, but it, it had a profound impact on me, just the way people value things. You know, this, it didn't have any, there was nothing tangible there, but you know, uh, people getting enjoyment out of it sort of assigned to this value. So anyways, long short, I kind of like to joke that I've been in digital assets since then, the year 2000. Um, fast forward a bunch of years, I have my master's um, in accounting and finance. Uh, I spent my early career as a certified public accountant. I was focused on high net worth individuals uh, and investment partnership tax strategies. So really optimizing um, for wealth generation and, and tax efficiency um, for people with, with money. And I did that for a few years, uh, pretty quickly discovered that the, the linear career path that that offered was not for me. Um, so I struck out on an entrepreneurial path and I was, I became the CFO of a trade show construction business. Um, early on in my career, I was there for a few years. Uh, I then moved back into tech, which has kind of been my, my nerdy obsession my whole life. And I was CFO for a hotel technology company uh, I then was a CFO for a healthcare software venture for some time and then started um, Parallax. My journey into crypto assets uh, was maybe a little different than some. I had started in Bitcoin in 2014, but for whatever reason, I didn't really take the deep dive and didn't fall 
past the event horizon or go down the rabbit hole, as some people say. Um, and I, I don't really know why. I think in retrospect, the name Bitcoin actually just, mm -hmm. I didn't look into it. I kind of had the Model T of cryptocurrencies, cognitive bias. But everybody, but everybody brushed it away, right? I mean, <laughs> like most people, yeah, even yeah. Andreas Antonopoulos, <laughs> so you just brushed exactly. aside. <laughs> so I brushed it aside. This is 14. You know, I had invested some, but, uh, you know, bought it a couple hundred, sold it a few hundred, thought I was a genius kind of thing. I interestingly didn't really fall down the rabbit hole until uh, actually through Ethereum. Um, this is late, I guess, mid-16, 16, late-16, 16, studying Ethereum and the concept of smart contracts. Um, my light bulb moment was the realization that the entire finance industry is intermediate, right? Between buyers and sellers. So, so therefore it is just a smart contract with human beings on top of it. So once I had this, I was like, that was a big light bulb for me. Um, I started making heavy investments into the space, um, kind of initially just allocated it into the top crypto assets. And then where my money went, my mind followed, I started studying it very deeply. And as I tell a lot of people, you know, there's a direct correlation between how much time you've spent studying the space and your uh, likelihood to be a Bitcoin maximalist or rationalist or whatever you want to call it. Um, the more you study, the more you realize that Bitcoin stands to capture the vast majority of all the value created in this wave of innovation. Um, and that's it. So we at Parallax, we operate a couple of uh, hedge funds. Um, we do have some focus in the digital asset space. Uh, in both crypto assets and equities, or the six equities. Um, and then we're also working on a uh, digital securities consulting practice, where we're trying to figure out how this technology can be applied to move other things of value, like stocks, bonds, and, and real estate. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so, you know, uh, what I, uh, people like you and uh, so many others, you know, who are in this space, they're doing really a great service to, uh, whatever community civilization at large uh, educating it it and it's you know as you said you know it's about the, the the degree or the intensity of how people how deep or how you know how open minded how willing they are to go into the rabbit hole and this is why you know uh, I think not only me but so many other people just uh, love your um, you know, your Twitter threads and everything you post uh, because uh, you take them like softly by the hand <laughs> and say, you know what, I'll show you some rabbits, but actually it's not about the rabbit, right? It's, it's about really going deep into the comprehension uh, process of, of uh, the, you know, understanding the interconnectedness. Uh, and you have a fundamental, uh, as, you know, as I can read, you have a fundamental understanding of, uh, you know, at least of the principles of Austrian economics, of monetary principles. Um, what do you think, um, with everything, um, that's why, you know, I want to talk to you, I want to first zoom out, like, uh, have mm. your perspective, your thought, zooming out everything that's been going on right now in the last few days, weeks, and months with, you know, going every, even like mainstream Trump talking about it, the federal, uh, chairman Powell, treasury secretary, Congress, you know, uh, people, uh, in the hearings with, uh, Facebook, Libra, Cal Libra, whatever, geopolitically, um, could you like give your take, your position, your perspective, your perception of what's going on right now? What are the hurdles, the obstacles for people to understanding? Uh, because it takes a time till they take action. And we are far away you know, from sort of user-friendly, intuitive, easy cheesy uh you know, buying of, of Bitcoin and hodling. And, and that's you know, people are overwhelmed. But I'm going to shut up now, but <laughs> what did you take like from the outer, like outer space going deeper, like into the, into the, you know, into the nut, into the details of your nutshell? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I guess zooming like all the way out, um, looking at money specifically, and this is, this drama is, this has been touched on by a number of people, but essentially, um, as you know, BJ and a lot of other guys say, hard money is the norm of human history. Um, you know, money is simply a technology used to move value across time and space. That's it. I know, you know, a lot of people find it to be very enigmatic, confusing. You know, a government has to issue it. If it doesn't, how does it have value? Where does it come from? Um, 
but it very simply is just that. Um, it's a, a tool used to move value across time and space. And throughout history, uh, you know, different goods which have fulfilled this purpose of money have competed against one another. Um, and this is very much an adversarial game because if one form of money uh, that's being used to hold value, you know, it's which when you say hold value, we're talking about a monetary premium, uh, which would be value in excess of its industrial use historically. Um, anything that is hard to produce uh, can actually, actually be used to compete with something that's easier to produce and extract the value from it. So kind of an example of that is the classical uh, gold versus silver. If anytime you can produce uh, gold or silver where your marginal cost are less than your marginal revenue, you will do that. So if gold is selling in the market for say $1,000 an ounce, uh, there will be mining competition all the way up to $9,999.99, right? Where someone can extract one say, pennies worth of profit off of that. So anyone that can do that, uh, say producing silver, they have a direct financial incentive to store those profits in the monetary medium that is hardest to debase. So that is the most resistant to supply changes. Um, so this competition among monetary technologies based on uh, hardness, kind of the hardness to produce, causes people to converge on a single form, single store value. Uh, and that's essentially you know, how we got gold in the world because of gold's chemical properties. Um, it's very hard to produce uh, and it's virtually indestructible. So all of the gold that's been mined throughout human history is more or less part of the extant supply today. And then each year the new supply flow that's produced is reliably low and predictable, a low and predictable percentage of that total supply. Um, and this is the the stock to flow ratio. Uh, it's become very popular, you know, Safety popularized this in his, his book, Bitcoin Standard, which is great and highly recommended for anyone that's interested in this. Um, and it really just quantifies this sort of primary characteristic money that determines uh, which one wins in the free market. So we had gold as universal money. It sort of outcompeted everything else for these reasons. Um, and then in the past 100 years, we've had this government co-opting of gold, where they've sort of stepped in and uh, to solve the convenience issues related to gold transaction, which we call the divisibility problem. You know, it's kind of hard to pay for your morning coffee with gold coins, they're hard to transport, they're heavy, cumbersome, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, banknotes issued that were redeemable in gold sort of solved this problem because it's much easier to transact in paper um, and ele electronic abstractions of that paper than it is the actual physical coin. The problem with this, of course, is that um, you know greed got the best of those in control of the gold supply, and the, they there have since been issued too many banknotes, well in excess of the gold reserves. And now, as we know today, you know, money is not fiat currency is no longer redeemable in gold. So, if you look at the kind of the grand arc, this. 5,000 year trajectory of human commercial history, 4,900 of those years have been hard money, uh, money determined on the free market. The past 100 years, we have this strange little uh, government co-opted, centrally planned um, market for money and interest rates uh, that we all know today. And we, you know, what we think is that you know, Bitcoin basically represents that regression to the norm of, of human history. Um, so that's sort of a zoomed way out. Uh, how Bitcoin does that specifically is that as a digital technology, and we've seen, we have seen and are seeing digital technologies, you know, disrupt uh, intermediated business models left and right. Uh, you know, we saw it with um, iTunes displacing, um, record labels and whatnot. Uh, clearly you've seen with Uber and Lyft, how they've displaced uh, taxi services. Um, you saw it with Netflix displacing Blockbuster, right? Anytime you can add a digital solution to a problem that you, you're, you've absorbed the, 
The functions that intermediaries typically provide manually can now be provided by software, essentially. So this makes it economically orders of magnitude better, right? You cross across made it much more efficient. Um, so in sort of these digital solutions to uh, problems that humanity's faced for you know, many, many years, all of a sudden are solvable in a very cheap and scalable way. And Bitcoin is just sort of the embodiment of that for money. Uh, it represents the dis, you know, a return to free markets for money and a disintermediating force um, against central banks. So and as far as the, the hurdles to adoption and what we're seeing lately, um, I think we're just really seeing the tail end of this, this grand government monetary experiment where we've just, we've seen micro versions of this play out repeatedly um, in individual countries that essentially every fiat currency ends in hyperinflation. Um, because if you look at it from a game theoretic perspective, like if you have, if you hold the reins or you hold the levers to control that money, uh, you have a direct financial incentive to create as much of it as possible to acquire scarce assets. Um, I think Rothbard said something like, you know, every public election is an opportunity to, to read the, the public uh, wealth, essentially, right? For, <laughs> And that's sort of, you know, kind of what we're seeing happening. And then among countries, there's also this race to the bottom where they're printing their currencies as quickly as possible um, to devalue their currencies, accelerate their exports, um, and sort of feed into this game theoretic feedback loop. And that's why the wheels are coming off. We're seeing the negative interest rate policies. We're seeing these... Uh, you know, I think the IMF put out something yesterday saying that they would use deeply negative interest rate policies to try yeah. to fight. It's mm -hmm. like, this is, we're literally in Narnia at this point. Yeah. I mean, if people are not waking up now, I don't know when, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, what does it take like to feel the pain? Like people yeah. in Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, Argentina, yeah. I don't know, wherever there's inflation, you know, yeah. or recessions coming up. And I think back to your original point, it's a lot of this, is veiled in jargon and esoteric language that people just don't understand. Right? Yeah. You say negative interest rate policy, you're like, what does that even mean? Exactly. Know. Yeah. But um, you know, at the end of the day, it's just another form of theft, which inflation is. It's a it's a violation of private property rights uh, and all these other policy tools that central banks use are essentially a form uh, of wealth confiscation. So I think you know it's a bit beholden upon us as people that maybe see the light to some extent, to try and communicate what's going on in the world um, in a more understandable fashion. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. This is where a lot of people get confused. It's like, oh, how does Bitcoin get believers? Like, if it doesn't have enough believers, then you know, money is a belief system that won't be supported. It's more as uh, some people say, it's, it imposes its economic reality on all holders of softer money, right? Um, so the supply of Bitcoin just keeps shrinking. You know, it cuts in half every four years. Um, its stock to flow ratio should exceed that of golds. Um, well then by the 2024 halving for sure, yeah. there's some debate about the existing stock and what is gold, et cetera, et cetera. So say over the next five years, it will exceed that of golds. Yeah, and a pretty good analysis was made by, you know, Plan B or the 100 trillion guy. Yes. Uh, he does some great work on yeah. stock to flow ratio. Uh, and in, in its relationship to the timing of the halving. So mm -hmm. there's great valuation work there. I think it had a very high correlation um, to stock to flow for, for Bitcoin specifically. Um, so we're, we're entering this time of humanity where we've never seen a, a liquid asset as scarce as Bitcoin. Uh, I, and just to put this in a little bit of perspective, I posted something yesterday that the new supply flow, annual new supply flow of Bitcoin in 2020 is around 328,000 units per year. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go. This is your post. Yeah, <laughs> you said, right. yeah, you said in the year 2020, the annual new supply flow of Bitcoin will be approximately 328,725,000 yeah. units, right? And in the year 2100, the annual new supply flow of Bitcoin will contract to 0 0.31 units. 
That's amazing. Yeah. That's I mean, yeah. never been done in history, right? I mean, yeah. the scars, like the absolute scars. Yeah. So if you can think, even the uh, the energy and operational capital expenditure being channeled into the Bitcoin mining network today, right, to compete for that annual new supply for 320,000 units, assuming no growth in hash rate or new market entry by miners, that same amount of energy would be concentrated into 0.31 annual unit production by the year 2100. So that the stock to flow ratio is going to grow, you know, over. 1 million X over the next 80 years. It is, it's literally mind boggling. If you consider the hardest monetary asset in the world today as a stock to flow, uh, again, debatable between 55 and 65. So this, it's a truly revolutionary technology. I think it imposes itself economically on people and it's, we're really, you know, by educating them about this, I think you're just doing people a favor. You're just kind of pulling back the veil that's been placed through this, again, esoteric jargon, um, saying, look, it's very simple. It's a technology that moves value across time and space. Uh, the money that we're forced to use today, the pseudo money, you can think of it as having, again, as a technology, kind of has a back door to it, where whoever issues that currency can basically siphon value off of it until it's valueless, uh, until it's inflated into worthlessness. And so for people individually, you know, most people trade their time for money. So this back door gives uh, currency issuers and central banks uh, a mechanism to steal people's time, you know? And that's important, I think, for people to realize that they're being uh, taken advantage of in that way, so. Yeah, as you said correctly. I mean, uh, in my I mean, my opinion too. Everything is compounding. Everything's. Do you think this is the time? This is the most exciting time coming up because everything is like coming together. I mean, seriously. I mean, without like making things up. I mean, just look at what you know. What is it now? Even in Iran, they are like whatever discussing yeah. whether it's uh, I don't know what the uh, what the fuck Realize like money. whether it's in. You know, in conformity with their, you know, whatever Islamic law and stuff. So, but, but, you know, I mean, it's about the people. People, as you said, it's going to, it's going to wake them up. It's going to, as you said, what did you say? Uh, imposed economic reality on them and you know and okay maybe they're not gonna do illegal mining anymore they will make maybe jack up the, the electricity prices as they've said in also in this article uh, to whatever seven cents per kilowatt hour but eventually maybe one of these countries it doesn't have to be Iran is going to be the trigger for you know eventually for a mass adoption and a huge gigantic black market uh, on this planet um, for Bitcoin, um, hyper Bitcoinization. Uh, do you think it's a process still, a very gradual, slow process, or do you think it needs just that tipping point, that little like triggering point, which which then you know, with all the other factors and parameters and geopolitical conditions and sanctions, embargoes, inflation is going just to tip it all. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, it's a great point and I think there's a lot of debate out there um, across the spectrum of what I would say there's the, the hyper bitcoinization narrative right where these individual countries currencies begin to collapse and as we've seen with hyperinflation events all over the world people seek to get out get out of the failing currency into a scarce asset so they know it can reliably hold its value across time and into liquid assets, right? Mm -hmm. The US dollar most recently has been a pretty popular instrument, is relatively stable and, and highly liquid. And essentially they're looking for, again, scarcity to preserve wealth and liquidity to preserve optionality, right? Because they're entering a very uncertain economic future for themselves. So they wanna know they have a set amount of value that they can readily exchange in the market for whatever they need, right? Food, housing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as a lot of people, you know, currency collapse sort of goes hand in hand with political collapse internally. Uh, a lot of people want to be able to get out of that country and get their wealth to, into another country, uh, with their families. So the ability to circumvent capital c controls is also very important in those situations. Mm -hmm. So, and if, if you just look at it through that lens, it's like, okay, people want liquidity, uh, 
people want scarcity and people want to be able to get around capital controls in the event of hyperinflation. Uh, those three qualities are better provided by Bitcoin than any other technology in history. So the, that, that is the hyper Bitcoinization narrative that these individual countries, as we're seeing in Venezuela today, um, but have seen it again across all countries historically, um, would individually collapse into Bitcoin or suffer a Bitcoin induced demonetization of the national currency. Uh, and the theory there is that maybe that builds into a kind of domino effect as, as we've seen it work in say a few countries that other countries, uh, you know, other people would wise up, say here in America saying, well, if that happened in Venezuela and it happened here and it happened there, could it happen here? And people start to ask the question, you know, what does our money supply look like? How's it being inflated, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other end of the, the spectrum for what Bitcoin adoption could look like is that this, uh, what Safe Dean calls the smooth upgrade, um, where people are essentially just shifting demand slowly but persistently over time uh, away from, from fiat currencies and into Bitcoin as it is more widely accepted as a medium of exchange, as more people are willing to be paid in it um, and accept payment in it. Um, so I, across that spectrum, I'm not entirely sure what it looks like. Does it happen smoothly over time or does it happen um, sort of at these inflection points of, of demonetization? I'm not entirely sure, but it is interesting. I, I like to say that Bitcoin converts electricity and human self-interest into indisputable truth and expansion of its network. Uh, it l literally is just churning out consensus and consensus with, with money is all that really matters. It's, it's who owns what. And it's, it's incentivizing everyone that interacts with it economically to use it and to expand it and to adopt it. So that formula works not only at the individual level, but also at even the nation state level, or the central bank level. So as you're saying, if, if Iran or any central bank, uh, it is announced that you know, they've taken a position in Bitcoin or they've added it as a reserve asset, um, or really if they're investing in directly through funds or whatnot, if any of that news comes to the surface, then all of a sudden every other central bank in the world has to look across the table and say, well, uh, if he's holding a position in Bitcoin, I now to protect my interest just from, his, from him have to hold a position as well. So that that's that, the competition, right, Robert? I yes, mean, exactly. So you're, again, you're in this prisoner's dilemma type game theoretic situation, not necessarily just at the individual level for, you know, deciding on where I'm going to store my value, is it gold, silver, et cetera, but also at the nation state level. Uh, and, you know, Bitcoin is just this unbelievably powerful ratchet effect on, on the game theoretic aspect. And, you know, now that it's really become, it's risen to the top of global consciousness, especially recently with the Trump tweet, um, you know, Federal Reserve Chairman is talking about it, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's on uh, the mainstream dialogue. I think it's only a matter of time before, mm -hmm. you know, everyone, out, everyone in the world is having the same type of discussion, right? They're performing the same type of strategic analysis. And if you're a central bank, uh, you know, with hopefully people that have a pretty deep understanding of economics, um, this is a, it is a sound strategy at some point, especially for, you know, a central bank that maybe is smaller and a little more nimble. So, um, Robert, you are a CEO, as I just uh, um, showed on your website over here, Parallax Digital. So, from your perspective um, or your experience, I mean, you you deal with uh, do you also deal with or you work with institutional investors or institutions or I'm thinking you know also of pension funds who are sitting like globally. Uh, I heard of I don't know forty trillion <laughs> US dollars right. something like that. Like what is going on in the background? Do you think they're uh, at least uh, hedging or whatever or st storing one percent? You know, a very minimal percentage into Bitcoin, but maybe some of them doing like totally secretly. Um, what is going on with-, with uh, Yeah, so we, a lot of our investor base is more high net worth individual family office. Uh, we do have some small uh, institutions as well. But I think 
at that level, you know, the pension and endowment space is interesting because after 2008, they've suffered such heavy losses that they can basically never make good on their uh, defined benefits for their, their retirees. Because I think, you know, they typically targeted in their models, say 60% a year investment returns uh, before they had to start paying out these, uh, these benefits. And 2008, you know, was such a huge drawdown across the board that at this point, there's not really a space that they can invest into that offers the asymmetric return profile necessary to get to make to get them to a place where they can make good on their obligations. So I think there's a huge incentive there for them to do it. Uh, but these large capital pools move very slowly, right? And they move very conservatively and they move mm -hmm. according to the regulation. And the biggest holdup right now is, you know, here in the US specifically, there's not an SEC approved custodian. There are some, I think there's some state approved asset custodians in Wyoming, mm -hmm. uh, maybe other states, but there's not an SEC approved, SEC approved crypto asset custodian um, that I'm aware of. So that I think is a big holdup for uh, seeing larger capital inflows um, into the space, but there is an incentive for them to be there. And then I think too, I mean, you touch on it individually, I'm sure anyone, again, anyone that's looked at this long enough, you know, if you're sitting on a, if, if you're a fiduciary for a large endowment, you're considering crypto assets, you've probably done your homework for a little while. I think at some point you're like, okay, this is, there's a possibility here. Um, and the, the other way I like to describe it to people is it's being adopted in the world at the periphery, right? So if you imagine the, the whole world is a sphere of people, on one end we have say Venezuela where people are literally herding out of their currency into Bitcoin so they know that they can buy coffee next week at a relatively consistent price. Um, so people are actually using it as a monetary lifeboat. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have, say, you know, ultra high net worth individuals, billionaires of the world saying, look, if this thing is, if this thesis does play out, uh, a 1% allocation into this asset class will keep me at even money. Even if all of my existing investments get disrupted and banking operations go to, you know, zero or near zero over time, but today a 1% allocation will provide me sufficient insurance policy to protect my financial position. So I think that it starts there, you know, it starts at the edges and it sort of permeates its way inward into more and more people. Um, you know, one end of the spectrum is, is more countries suffer from hyperinflation. And at the other end of the spectrum is, you know, basically Bitcoin continues to perform. So 1% allocation becomes a 5%. Maybe they rebalance down to two or one, but it keeps growing. Um, and that, you know, the growth is uh, self-reinforcing and should uh, shift into kind of that very steep phase of the, the innovation adoption curve, which is typically kind of S-shaped and gets, mm -hmm. gets really steep when uh, we enter the early adopter phase. So I think we're close. I don't know that we're quite there. The estimates are like 30 to 100 million crypto asset holders. Very hard to determine that number. Oh yeah, that's what I was gonna ask you. Your estimate, because there's so much speculation, how many people are there really? I mean, is it like 30 million, 100 million, 200 million? I mean, can we say that? I mean, or is it just not feasible because of whatever, all these multiple addresses or you know, funds not being moved for so many years? And Yeah, um, I think it's not precisely feasible. Yeah. Uh, it is you know, intentionally kind of obfuscated by design which is actually a good thing. But I, I think the proxies of, you know, pointing to around 30 to 100 million, which is clearly a huge range, but even if it's double that, we are still so incredibly early, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's about accurate. And then as far as what phase we're entering on the, the innovators adoption curve, I, I would say we're, this bull run will take us into the early adopter phase. I think when Bitcoin breaks, hundred thousand dollar USD, um, which again, I'm not a huge price guy, but it's very important psychologically. And let's yeah. be frank, it draws attention to it like nothing else. Um, and when it crosses, as we saw when it crossed a thousand, across 10,000, there's this, uh, 
new uh, shakeup in the world. If you're like, what's going on with Bitcoin? You see the Twitter uh, volume explode, Google searches explode, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, I think we're on that path. So after, I don't know how many obituaries we've already celebrated, <laughs> 360 or 400 obituaries of Bitcoin. So it's, you know, I mean, it's a sad thing, but it's funny at the same time, this, uh, the, the, the human psychology, you know, you remember when it went up to 20,000 and everybody was like FOMOing in. Uh, so this is going to happen, I think, over and over again. So the next time it goes like again to 20, 30, 50 or even 100, uh, you know, by 2021 after the next halving, with yeah. everything like halving the stock to flow ratio, maybe, you know, some external uh, events uh, occurring, people are going to FOMO in, right? They're going to panic again. I mean, unfortunately I, too late. I mean, not too yeah. late, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, why, why can't they, you know, be so conscious and try to understand that it's about their future? You know, this mm. is about their monetary, economical, existential future. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, you know, people, people are people. FOMO and FUD drives a lot of human behavior in the world, actually. Uh, think about dating or your job or anything else. People are always trying to, you know, position themselves for the next best thing, I guess. Um, I think, and uh, Mark Yusko says this well, that people have a tendency to buy what's at a premium and sell what's at a discount. I don't know, like how many people bought Bitcoin at or near 20,000 only to say, you know, fuck it and sell it at say five to 3,000. Um, that is sort of inherent to the monetization of an asset like this. There's not really anything you can do about it. Uh, these are, you know, market, free market forces expressing themselves in real time. And the other thing that's not commonly talked about with Bitcoin that I actually think plays into this dramatically is that its supply curve is perfectly inelastic. Mm -hmm. uh, this is another fundamental quality of a commodity um, that we've never seen before. So what this means is that if gold today, whatever it is, $1,400 an ounce, if it all of a sudden goes to say 2,000 an ounce over the next year, all of a sudden the, the increase in the marginal revenue, which you can sell uh, each ounce of gold for, it incentivizes new entrance into gold mining, right? And it also makes other means of gold mining that may have not been economically feasible. Say it costs, you know, 1600 an ounce to produce gold this particular method. If it's selling at 1400, nobody's doing it. If all of a sudden it goes to 2000, they're gonna start doing it, right? Again, uh, all the way until marginal costs equal marginal revenue. So that, but changes in the price of gold can actually be expressed uh, in its supply. So it can actually uh, reduce its stock to flow ratio in responses to changes in its price. Meaning it's elastic, essentially. Its supply is elastic to, uh, to price. Bitcoin is totally different. No matter how much demand there is or how much price increase there is in Bitcoin, the supply curve is essentially immutable. It doesn't change. It's, it has no elasticity whatsoever. So at this demand, increases in demand for Bitcoin can only be expressed through its price. Um, and I think this really exacerbates the, the FOMO situation. Um, you know, again, particular at having dates, which historically, which is a very limited sample size, but appear to be a trigger event for these bull runs. Um, I think it just b builds into a frenzy. And, uh, you know, VJ calls these kind of these fractal waves where you see the, uh, trough of disillusionment and the, I figure what it is, the whole wave there, but that's the cycle that I think, I agree with you, that it will repeat over the next, what do you call it, five to seven years um, until I think there is a tipping point eventually where it's, it just shifts from a risk on asset into a risk off asset. Um, as it is, you know, the whole thing with money is you want to know that you own a relative share of the existing supply that won't be compromised. So I think as more people wake up to that truth, it's like I can own a definitive piece of the Bitcoin network essentially, and know that no one else can inflate it or, or um, usurp it from me. Uh, that becomes a very powerful and compelling narrative for Bitcoin as a risk off, the ultimate risk off asset. Um, 
where we've seen people throughout time sort of flock back to the trustlessness and permissionless of gold, uh, I think we'll see the same for Bitcoin. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, so for um, we have we still have 10, 15 minutes, Robert. So you've art, you've beautifully articulated, uh, I mean, really step by step, the, the the thought process of you know for understand let me let me just pull this up again uh on your twitter thread. uh you talked about legal monopolies there are some keywords i wrote down um legal monopolies uh which you know uh, sort of is uh, uh on the foundation of fiat currencies uh geopolitical situation now uh you know i always like to bring it back uh the discussion to what is what is the core intention of Bitcoin or Satoshi Nakamoto's vision? It's about separation of money from the state. It's about freedom. It's about, actually, it's about human rights. It's about total freedom. Um, um, and, you know, and, and freedom from, you know, and total independence from these totally obsessively controlled centralized structures. Would it be central banks, the IMF, um, governments in collusion with governments who controls whom is another question <laughs> yeah. what is what is your take on that i mean how um, without even i don't want to even go into the criminality of these whole structures but uh, do you think we we are at the right time right place for this for this evolution uh you know i i really do uh a lot of people are calling this the bitcoin perfect storm where you know the wheels coming off of this expansionary monetary policy experiment worldwide, you know, um, as seen in all of the policies we mentioned earlier. Uh, so geopolitically and in the global macro context, it's a perfect storm for Bitcoin adoption. We have, you know, essentially QE infinity, which is quantitative easing infinity, where people are producing money and credit to, and to solve every problem, um, you know, air quotes solve every problem. And so in that environment, you know, in a nutshell, value flows to scarcity. When you have this, this excess production of money, value will flow um, to the scarcest assets. So you know, gold, Bitcoin, real estate. Um, I think too that the, it's interesting with money. And another thing people don't really understand about money is the concept of sovereignty. Um, so sovereignty essentially means like the authority and permission to conduct an action, um, we would say. And so with U.S. dollars, for instance, um, you are subject to counterparty risk uh, in the form of U.S. government, in the form of the payment uh, system that enables the, uh, the payment itself, where they can, you know, say, censor your transaction, um, as we've seen done in a lot of places in the form of capital controls and what have you. Uh, they can also, as we talked about, they can inflate the money supply. So they can extract value from, from your monetary unit um, into their own hands. And one of the real key benefits that a free market money offers, um, you know, say gold, for instance, is that gold is self-sovereign. So if I flip you a gold coin across the table, uh, you don't need anyone's permission to spend that. You don't need to trust that anyone's gonna debase that. Uh, it's, it's laws and value are preserved by the free market, essentially, um, which is beyond anyone's individual control. So versus handing you a US dollar, again, you have to trust. Well, is the, is the bank gonna be good for it? Is the government gonna back it up? Is FDIC insurance gonna come through? All these things. Um, so gold is basically a self-sovereign form of money is, and this is why I don't like it when people call nation states the sovereign, because they only became sovereign by really usurping the sovereignty from gold. When they, um, you know, Executive Order 6102, when they confiscated gold from citizens in the U.S., and they've done, you know, other measures like this all over the world, these are governments stepping in and saying, hey, you know, this free market money, gold, which ascended to dominance, we now need to protect ourselves from it. Uh, by confiscating it, centralizing it. And it's necessary for us to own a large share of that market. I think central banks have, say, 16% of the gold supply today to enforce their legal monopoly on fiat currency. So to impose 
use of an inferior technology on its people, they have to protect it from competition from the superior technology, which in this case was gold, and as we think now is uh, Bitcoin. So this concept of gold being kind of the, the ancient sovereignty layer for Earth, where you know, it became free market money because of its you know, economic properties, which are built on its chemical properties. Um, and that was honest money. That was real money. That was free market money. Um, everything that we have today is just this coercion, effectively. And when you look at it through that light, you know, Bitcoin is basically a competing sovereignty layer for Earth. Um, it's superior to gold in a lot of ways. We've already touched on it. Uh, that's kind of the new lens I'm trying to share it with. It's like, you know, this is more than just money and payments, whatever it is, literally about personal, individual freedom, collective freedom. Um, collective wealth, by the way, because every time you move away from a free market, you're reducing the aggregate wealth that that market can produce. So any friction to trade, any, frankly, any regulation, anything that impedes uh, people acting in their own self-interest to express the greater interest reduces aggregate wealth for the world. Um, and, you know, I think that the monopoly on money, the legal, legally imposed monopoly on money is the biggest chain around our neck that, that humanity's ever had. Um, so, yeah, it's very exciting time to be alive. I think the time is right for Bitcoin. And um, central banks are really helping us out, frankly. Um, the more dollars and yen and euro they produce, chasing less and less Bitcoin just sort of feeds this appreciation. They're doing us a favor, right? I mean, they're actually literally doing their own booby traps with this whole thing, like a, yeah. like a crack junkie, right? I mean, uh, there's no way out. I mean, I mean, what I what I must say, uh, I, I gotta hold it. You know, I'm, uh, I do want to compliment them in a way. The system that it ha has been able to postpone this whatever you know this yeah. transition or the implosion yeah. of this huge you know. Uh, like good, system, you know. I, mean? I would put it like this: like any good parasite, they're really good at keeping their host alive. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know, absent Bitcoin, how long could they have kept this alive? I mean, who who knows? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. All right, Robert, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, uh, you want to have uh, like? Uh, do you have any final thoughts, or you think it's something is important people should hear or, or uh, research, or or where they can find you, or you know what to read? Yeah, so uh, I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, Handle is at breedlove22, B-R-E-E-D-L-O-V-E -E -E 22. Um, I post mostly about Bitcoin and, and economics, but also some other stuff. Uh, I really encourage, you know, the best investment in the space is knowledge and, and self-education. Uh, if you have time to read a book, you know, go read the Bitcoin standard. I think that's great. Uh, if you just have time for maybe an essay, uh, the bullish case for Bitcoin uh, by VJ is is great. Um, and then if you're more of a listener type, uh, Stephen Levera's podcast, you know, starting from the beginning, frankly, he goes all through Austrian economic thought uh, and how Bitcoin fits into the picture. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we also publish stuff on our website uh, and blog. Um, I'm working on a new piece now that will hopefully be out about the next month. Um, and yeah, do a lot of threads on Twitter uh, in an attempt to try and make this a more palatable understanding uh, format for broader audiences. That's exactly what is needed to break this down. Because as yeah. you said, you know, people, I think most people are just too overwhelmed. They don't have the time, maybe, all, you know, they don't have the energy to research. Yeah. You got to like really pedagogically break it down as if you want, if you wanted to explain it to a seven year old, you know, uh, yes. I mean, people are already overwhelmed with a, with a Trezor Harbor wallet, you know, yes. I yeah, have yeah. to explain to them like for the 15th time and I'm like, how they're gonna do like you know all these whatever other features there you know wasabi right. coin join privacy security this and that it's just too much you know mm -hmm. so i think it we really need that phase where we we go like into the internet the, you know open up the browser click click and it's done yeah. uh but you know but we are still in that i guess you know you would agree with me in that monetary evolutionary phase of store of value just buy yeah. it hold it 
and just forget about it, right? Or just That's upsets. Absolutely right. That's <laughs> absolutely right. Uh, it's a well-worn path historically that it evolves, you know, kind of store value, the medium of exchange before becoming, you know, in, in our brain as a unit of account. Like today we think in dollars, but one day, um, you know, maybe we'll think in sats. So Exactly. I mean, yeah, I agree that, you know, the user interface has to improve, but there is... You know, if you look at the internet itself, it's a great proxy for that. Um, we're really good at, at abstracting and innovating away complexity. So I have very high hopes over the next 10 years, you know, Bitcoin will be much easier to interact with for the day-to-day -day user. Yeah. So, uh, Robert, in the future, I want to invite you, if you have time and, uh, you know, the, this, uh, and, uh, interest, uh, I would love to invite you for panel discussions with pretty known Bitcoiners, you know, uh, also, you know, people who also, un, you know, mu know much more than me about Austrian economics, such as Eric Vasquez or, yeah. or other people or, you know, Connor Brown or Dan Held. So I, I am, and that's why, you know, I call myself the total connector because I all, you know, I have a very, you know, humble field of knowledge, but I'm trying to connect the dots for the people. You know, because everybody's, you know, inspiring one another. So uh, this is the whole purpose of this, you know, of this show is to really inspire, like, you know, which facet haven't we looked at yet, you know? Yeah, right, right, right. So, yeah, yeah it's about... And that's a great, great cause, by the way. Thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you, Robert, uh, for everything you're doing. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> you're serving humanity. <laughs> about Bitcoin is that you can see it through all these different lenses. So I really encourage, you know, the more you look at it, you just... It's incredible. It's the biggest invention I, I think we'll see in our lifetimes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. All right, Robert. I'd love to attend the panel discussions. All right. I'll, I'll let you know. Thank you, Robert. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.